Hey guys, welcome to Yesterday's Coffee, the podcast where we chat about fitness, nutrition, and business all over coffee that may or may not have been brewed yesterday. Today, we are touching on whether or not the size of a muscle influences how you should train it, whether that's volume, frequency, or anything else in regards to actually growing um, and adding mass to that area. Is this a question you get very often? I think the question that I get more often, but like... So muscle size aside, the question I get the most often I think is more about training splits. Mm -hmm. So how often I should train a muscle if I want to see growth. Um, You know, I think a lot of people looking to add mass end up adopting like a body part split where they may only be training one muscle group, you know, once. Yeah, like training the muscle group once per week typically and thinking that, you know, that's going to be better for muscle growth because they're getting more stress on that muscle group within one session, Mm -hmm. Um, which that makes sense to a certain degree. So this study, I think, points out um, a couple really good things about frequency and how to get the best amount of muscle mass. Yeah. And there's a lot of thought out there um, about specific types of training for certain muscle groups, like if it's a smaller muscle group, like your arms, buys or tries, um, that you can get away with higher frequency because it's going to take less uh, recovery time. It's going to impact your CNS to a lesser degree than, say, if you're training your quads, a much larger muscle group. Um, and so the kind of accumulate knowledge on this topic and all the studies that have been done in different facets point to point in a certain direction as far as what makes the most sense with this. Um, Because we read an article that took a bunch of different studies Mm -hmm. and looked over what, if any of the size differences in muscles actually mattered in regards to training and in regards to volume. Yeah. So the studies we're looking at low frequency versus high frequency in these different muscle groups. Um, the, The main thing to point out here is that all of these studies were done in groups of people who were untrained or yeah. not with a ton of training experience, mm-hmm. um, which kind of slightly changes the outcome just a little bit. But all of the studies were relatively similar in the way that they measured these volumes. Um, well, I think the first thing we want to touch on is how they actually determined the muscle size differences. Oh, yeah. So Absolutely. So in determining how large or big a muscle is, like most people think – of certain muscles from a visual standpoint and I think of how large that might be. Oh yeah, I learned a lot from this part. <laughs> yeah, and so in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of cases that can be fairly true, but in other cases it can be completely um, different between what you might think. So in this case, like your quads, those happen to be the biggest muscles in your body. It's pretty easy to look at and understand that, mm-hmm. but something that you might take for granted is the size of your calves in relation to Um, other muscle groups, and they're actually looking at the volume of muscle. Um, And so what these studies looked at was the volume of muscle in untrained cadavers, because that's just what most studies have the highest amount of access to. You can't really, like, dissect a living human being's Right. Most people (laughs) don't want you dissecting them. Yeah, so you can't really see the true volume of muscle. There's not really a lot of um, ways to get insight into, like, a pro bodybuilder's muscle volumes. Um, so that would be really interesting. Though. It would be really interesting. <laughs> but the, the volumes that were used were determined from untrained cadavers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what's interesting there is that in an untrained person, the calf is the calf muscles are, I think they said second or third largest muscle group in the entire body. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think they voted them as being second in relation to the glute max, but when you put all three glute muscles together, the glutes outweigh the right. calves. So that put it in the third. Yeah. Um, with quads being first, glutes being second, and calves, then calves. And then hamstrings and then upper body. Yeah. And the the one muscle that was really surprising they talked about were the lats uh, because they're a very large, expansive muscle, but they're not terribly thick yeah. in relation it's to other flat, muscle groups. It's a thin muscle. So the, the overall volume of that muscle is actually significantly lower than you might think. Mm -hmm. Um, So obviously some of these ratios would be quite different in a trained individual, um, especially like the ratio of calf volume to everything else. Mm -hmm. But that is what they used to determine uh, 
what muscles that they're going to categorize as large and small, just so you know as we get into the, the studies here. So you talk about the frequency then. <laughs> Well, so, I read this, so I read this yesterday, and it's not quite as fresh for so, me. So there, there were like 14-something studies that were yeah, looked at. Yeah, there was at, a lot that I, that I went through. And each, each one kind of looked at something a little bit different. So the first ones looked at just straight-up volume. So if we compare small gr muscle groups, which we're going to categorize as like the triceps, biceps, um, the delts, basically a lot of the upper body muscles, pecs, those would be your small muscle groups. And then if we compared them to large muscle groups, so your glutes, calves, um, quads, and we look at how adjusting training volume affects your progress with those, the studies that compared low volume training, so anywhere from like one to two sets, um, or maybe just like one session per week. There were a few different studies that did it a little differently compared to higher volume. So maybe upwards of six working sets or um, higher in some other cases. The effects for both small and large muscles were the same. So what that means is if you were training a small muscle group or a large muscle group with low volume, the difference in muscle size was the same for both. And then if you were training a small muscle group and a large muscle group with high volume, the difference was the same in both. So mm -hmm. whether or not they improved, each group of either small or large muscles improved or didn't improve or decreased the, the same, same amount. Yeah. So there was no difference between whether it was a small muscle or a large muscle. So that's pretty interesting. No, it's pretty interesting. And I guess it also underlines the fact that volume overall is, is going to be the most important thing, but you can break that volume up differently. So just so as long as the muscle is being worked to a high volume, it doesn't matter if all of that volume is happening in one session or if those sessions are spread out throughout the week. Yeah. So frequency was something else that they looked at. Um, because And it's interesting to think about because you might think like if it's a large muscle, you're going to need more volume to stimulate all the muscle fibers and more volume is going to be um, more effective than it would a smaller muscle group, which you'll be able to get all of your work done mm -hmm. with less volume. It's not going to require as much work, but that's not necessarily the case. In fact, it's pretty much being shown time after time in these studies that whether that's a small muscle group like the biceps or it's the quads, once you train it more and more and more up to a point, so still within your recovery capabilities, mm -hmm. that you're going to get better benefit from that. Absolutely. Well, and also it underlines the, the importance of recovery because this is all dependent on your personal ability to recover. Right. Um, and what we know is those larger muscle groups typically take longer to recover, so that can also you know, help you determine what your frequency or how far apart those training sessions should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're a well-studied individual, you're like, okay, volume, great. But what about frequency? What about these programs where instead of doing all of my volume for a muscle group in one session, what if I'm breaking that up into multiple sessions per week where say I'm hitting every body part twice per week instead of once per week? So that's mm -hmm. what the next group of studies looked at. Mm -hmm. um, and they did it a couple different ways. They did First, they looked at splitting up um, training frequency while keeping the overall volume and tonnage the same. So tonnage is where you take the amount of sets times the amount of reps um, across the entire week. So if you're doing one session with 10 sets of 10 reps, and then you'd also multiply that by your weight. So if you got 10 sets, 10 reps at 100 pounds, 10 times 10 is 100, times 100 is what, 10,000? Mm -hmm. um, and then it would be the same tonnage if you split that in half for two sessions and did five sets of 10 at 100 pounds on Monday and then five sets of 10 at 100 pounds on Thursday. Same tonnage there, but different frequency. Yeah, so we can streamline tonnage as like the amount of work being done within the same week. Right. So the first group of studies looked at different frequencies, same tonnage. So same amount of work being done. And what those actually showed is that in some cases – the um, small and large muscle groups both declined in their uh, amount of size added. So they actually lost, they atrophied a little bit, 
Um, and some of the studies were better than others, but it still showed that you were seeing the same types of results, whether it was a small muscle group or a large muscle group. So the same effect is happening, mm-hmm. again, regardless of whether we've got the low frequency or the high frequency when the same amount of work is being done. Then we had another group of studies that did the same thing, looked at low frequency and high frequency. So one session per week of training that muscle group versus two or more, but then they didn't control tonnage. So you could actually do more work. And this is what makes more sense in the real world, because if you're training twice a muscle group twice per week, you're going to be able to get better quality work and more volume in mm-hmm. between those two sessions. Like you're getting more work done. Right. Because if, if you're trying to do like 10 sets of bench press in one day at a certain weight, that's going to be way harder than if you're um, splitting that up into two days two, that you're doing yeah. five sets. You're exactly. going to be able to do a lot more weight or you're going to be able to do more reps. So therefore more tonnage. And when you take a look at studies that we're doing it this way, where you're getting more work done within those two sessions versus one, then both small group muscle groups and large muscle groups increased and benefited at the same rate. So it was more beneficial to train more frequently, but it made no difference whether it was a small muscle group or a large muscle group again. So in the studies that looked at keeping the tonnage the same, but just spreading out the volume Mm -hmm. in different sessions, do you think that those differences or decreases in muscle volume were because they weren't able to get as much stress done at one time? Or do you think it was more recovery in between sessions? Um, it could be. I mean, it, it's tough to know. It's probably, um, it, it could be that you're getting a larger stimulus um, that's enough to stimulate growth in that one session depending on the amount of volume that they were doing so if it was Mm -hmm. if it was a small enough um, amount of work that they were consolidating in one session that was enough to stimulate growth but then if you split it in half it wasn't enough yeah I could potentially see that being something Um, well because I guess my question is would that be the only difference then between those two groups that controlled for tonnage and didn't control for tonnage Because you'd have to think that, like, even if the tonnage is the same across the week, if you're still at, like, the upper end of, you know, that growth threshold, you should still be able to see progress equally with that versus increasing your work over the week. Right. Yeah. I mean, you should still see progress. And there are plenty of people that obviously see progress when they're just training Mm -hmm. once each body part once per week versus twice per week. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was kind of a strange thing to see in the study. And they they kind of account for that, that some of these um, weren't necessarily the easiest to draw conclusions from, especially Mm -hmm. when, especially when you're dealing with um, like random populations, people that are untrained. And especially they actually noted that in this one, that it's very strange for untrained individuals to not progress from any sort of... Yeah. um, protocol that they're running. So there's probably something going on with that. But across all of the studies, averaging everything out, we still come to that same conclusion for the original question, which is that training frequency and training volume both affect large and small muscle groups in the, the same way. The same way. way. Yes. Yeah. So you're not going to have so to train arms more or less frequently than legs. Exactly. So basically what that comes down to then is setting up your training split, your volume and frequency, number one, based on your schedule, you know, the time that you have available, whether Mm -hmm. you need to split up your volume a little bit differently. And then it comes down to training maybe some lagging muscle groups or training muscle groups that you're specifically focused on a little bit more frequently or with more volume. Right. Yeah. If you've got a certain area that you're trying to bring up Um, relative to everything else, you need to devote more time and energy to that. But there doesn't seem to be um, a certain point where, depending on that muscle that you're trying to bring up, that you want to cap it. It really all comes down to what you can recover from and Mm -hmm. what that frequency looks like. So if you can, so best case scenario, if there's a particular muscle group that you're trying to bring up, the higher the frequency and the higher the overall volume that you can properly recover from Mm -hmm. is what's going to give you the best results. And 
um, you should be trying to train it as frequently as possible. Yes. Again, not overlooking recovery. Right. And, you know, we've talked about different ways that you can measure recovery. You can use heart rate variability. You can just pay attention to your body, sleep quality, all those other things. Um, but recovery is still a really key piece to all of this. Yeah. And I think it would be interesting to see um, at what point between a single body part training um, plan and a multiple um, session per week of the same body part plan, where that difference lies in overall volume. Uh, because we know if the volume is low enough based on a couple of these studies that the groups that trained it only once per week actually benefited more. Mm -hmm. um, but we also know that as you increase overall volume with frequency, that that benefits you more than just a single tr training session of that body part. So it'd be yeah. interesting to see what that volume split is where you diverge from the benefit of one training session to two. Um, that'd just be something that I think would be worthwhile looking into. Yeah. The, the other thing that I wanted to bring up with these muscle building studies that I think is a huge flaw is that there's no um, means of controlling nutrition with these Yeah, so you have people. to ask those questions of like, okay, was there a difference between the groups that trained more or trained less? Like, were the people who were training more eating more because their appetite was higher? Right, I mean, that's the biggest question right there. We know yeah. that... We know that food is what, and calories are what stimulate the growth. Yeah. Like no matter how hard you're training, if you don't have the raw material there to build the muscle mass, Nothing's it gonna doesn't happen. matter. Um, and so to see these statistical significant differences within groups that are doing different training protocols, but have no, uh, especially when you're changing up volume and mm -hmm. you're changing up training frequency, but you don't have a control of nutrition and you don't have a control of baseline metabolism and caloric expenditure. Like there's, there's so many other elements to this that yeah. just make this a total guessing game. And like, it makes sense because there probably is a decent correlation of how well people stick to their normal diet across these studies. There's mm -hmm. probably not a huge variance there, but there could be. And we don't know that. And that variance in the caloric intake could be the prime mover in the statistical significance of the muscle growth. Yeah. But we don't know that. Yeah, we don't know we that. We could never know that. So until somebody yeah, actually really runs a study like that, uh, we don't know if the largest contributing variable there is training frequency, training volume, or caloric intake. Yeah, and it's so tough to say because I, I feel like, you know, it would be safe to think that the average person is is on a diet <laughs> like the average person is dieting in some capacity meaning that they're you know well their meals day to day are going to be relatively similar mm -hmm. because they're mindful about it but i think on the other side you could also assume that maybe people who are just like the average person that they're choosing for the study who are open to this kind of thing maybe aren't on a diet and are just kind of listening to their body, in which case you would assume that those people are eating more on the day that they train more or mm -hmm. are eating more in a week that they train more. Yeah, listening to their body being a major wild card as to what that Well, But that's what I'm means. saying. So, like, that's the hardest thing to, like, because you, you could try to generalize this, but you really can't because there are two different groups that could be going into this. Yeah, and I mean, to my knowledge, I don't think any of these studies even – touch the subject, but I would uh, yeah. think that if a study even did, they would probably be doing it by dietary recall. And it would just be over the yeah. last eight weeks, did you make any significant changes to your diet? And we know that dietary <laughs> recall is the least effective means of measuring what your nutrition intake is. Yeah. Um, so that that's still one of the biggest questions in my mind and why, why I think um, while obviously science and studies are very important and actually honing in on these variables is really, really nice to be able to do, um, the anecdotes that we see in the real world are at times even more beneficial mm -hmm. because there aren't studies that have been done to look at all of these different uh, variables. And when you take something that is as important as calorie intake – in regards to muscle building, and we don't have a control for that, looking at different volumes, you've got to look to people that are doing it in their own training. And you can see how those changes are affecting 
what they're doing on that um, like case study, mm -hmm. but we don't have necessarily all of the literature there to be able to point to. No. And that's, that's always the case. It's always catching up to what's already been happening in the gym and in the kitchen for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Science gets around to actually testing those variables. Yeah, I think the the research and the literature can just sometimes be frustrating for that reason. But the bottom line here is that no significant difference between size of muscle groups. So you don't have to train any muscle groups differently based on their size. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about overall volume, like I said earlier, take a look at your schedule first, what makes the most sense for you, and then focusing on getting more volume in any muscle groups that you're specifically trying to grow. Yep. More volume, more frequency is good up to a point. Try to find what that point is and then recover and eat and grow. Yeah. That's the name of the game. Exactly. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have anything you'd like us to cover in the future, feel free to reach out to myself at hypertrophit.com. You can find Alexa at therootedrd.com and we will see you again next week. See you guys next week.